from Rochester, New York. This is Mad Dog Movies, Episode 3. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Boas. I'm an animator and screenwriter and all-around great guy. And I am John Vincent, filmmaker, and been working in the business for a number of years and hopefully uh, be able to help you guys out. We've uh, got some feedback from the first couple episodes, which I think we should do right off the top. Sounds good to me. All right. Uh, A couple message boards I posted on. I got some simple responses. A guy named MCS said, good stuff, interesting, keep it up. That was nice encouragement. Not very specific, but that's nice friend of mine on Facebook. She says, hi, Mike, I'm listening to your podcast. You should say something at the beginning of your show so the listener can tell which of you is which. I don't know your voice. Now, we introduced ourselves in the first episode, but then I sort of chopped up. We had a big, long session. I chopped it up into pieces, and we didn't have introductions. Just so it's clear, I am John Vincent, the one with the good voice. That's correct. And I'm usually the one asking the questions going, yep, uh uh-huh, and uh, and John has all the answers. (laughs) Well, not all the answers. Well, yeah, but uh, you had some answers. I had some questions. Which brings us right back to where we were. <laughs> All right. I've got another question here. Actually, this is actually a little more in-depth here. Uh, this is from a guy named uh, Bones, who uh, I know from Rochester. I've met him a couple times. Hey, Mike, I love the new podcast. It's got a real pro sound to it, and knowing that this is happening in my hometown makes it even better. I can relate to it. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I have a quick question about music and movies and short films. I've started editing this title sequence for this zombie flick I've been dreaming up, and I need a piece of music to edit, so I just chose a song from Nine Inch Nails. Well, it turns out that this music is very fitting for the intro, but I'm unsure about it. How do I go about getting rights to using a song from an artist? Is it really that hard? Is it as simple as asking an artist if I can use one of their songs, or do I need to go all through this legal crap? I just want to know so I don't get too deep into editing. Thanks. So, that's... uh. A question I've seen come up a lot on, you know, in message boards and online, and and uh, I haven't dealt with it very much personally. I am, I have a music video project I'm working on, but I actually know the artist who who owns the music, you know. So which makes it a lot easier. Yeah, if you and, can do that. That's definitely a way to do it. Um, and what I was able to do was I researched music synchronization rights. Uh, there's you know websites online you can look that up, and I downloaded uh, you know a form, a release form basically. Um, and I, you know, I download it and I can alter it, say, okay, this clause won't work for me and won't work for him and we can change it. And then we both sign it and everyone knows what they're getting. Essentially, I would be doing, you know, I would have the copyright on the video on the, on the final piece, but I'm getting the rights from this guy to use the music. Approaching a band or someone with a label and a lawyer and, you know, the record industry association, you know, that would be somewhat tricky and yeah well the experience i've had with it um with other people films that i've worked on other people dealing with the issue there's a couple different ways of going about doing it you can have what they call festival rights Mm -hmm. uh, exhibition rights uh basically which gives you a very limited way of using it so you can put it in your project and you can take it to the festivals you can try to get um someone to buy it the trouble is once it's purchased and if you're going to distribute it uh, in a public exhibition other than a festival setting, you have to re-obtain the rights for that, and it's going to cost you a lot more. There is a cost for both of them. And now what sometimes people like to do is right off the bat, they try to get the full rights for it, and then they're in the clear. But it does cost quite a bit of money to do so, and it depends on the on the bit of music, too. It's going to obviously going to be cheaper if you say pick some obscure song from the '70s that no one ever hears anymore, uh, as opposed to uh, your Nine Inch Nails song, something or or something even more contemporary than that, it could cost you quite a bit of money to do that. What we're doing with our film, which is the uh, Lovecraftian type of movie we're doing, mm-hmm. is I'm going to be performing uh, the music myself and writing the music myself with a couple of friends. Mm-hmm. And this way we don't have to worry about it. Then all the rights and everything belong to us. Uh, The big problem you're going to find if you're going to try to sell the project is clearance, uh, which means you have to go through a lot of legal work. You have to have a lot of paperwork. Uh, No one's going to buy your project unless every little legal thing is in order, uh, meaning that you have clearance for every bit of audio. And that's just not the music. But if you buy sound effects... Mm -hmm. If you have uh, anything visually in 
the picture from a Coke can to anything that's a cop copywritten material or has some kind of trademark, something very recognizable. Uh, you have to get clearance for all that stuff. And that's why uh, that's one of the reasons why films cost so much is because you have to have legal people to do that. But if you're doing a short film and you just drew in the festivals, uh, then you can get the music and get festival rights. The cost of them, I'm not too sure. We're going to probably in the future, in the next podcast or two, have a filmmaker by the name of Matt Ellers who had just finished a film called Smoking Laws. And he just went through that whole thing with the music and the right. So I'm going to have him come on and address that, uh, address this question probably. Yeah, we can bring that way. up again. Yeah. There's also, uh, when you go to TV, they want, uh, I can't remember exactly the term for it, but there's uh, insurance that uh, applies to, they don't want to be liable if, you know, if perhaps you haven't secured rights or things. We talked about this before. It's something very interesting with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Return of the Living Dead. Okay. That the sound, the music that you heard in the movie theater, right? Uh, that's on the soundtrack. The songs, uh, there are some differences between that and the video release. And why don't you explain why? Well, they couldn't get the rights, basically, um, or they were too expensive. Uh, they had a great punk rock soundtrack, and they secured the rights for the theater, uh, but the home video market wasn't. Well, it was. It was really starting its boom at that time. It was like '85. So I think when it went to video. Uh, they had trouble getting some of the songs or paying, really, for the, some of the songs. It was too expensive. so they Because they had to pay for them again. Right. They would have to pay again. So they then uh, filled in the blanks with some other songs. So there are fans of the movie um, that you know are angry at certain video releases. And I think the current DVD release doesn't have all the songs that were originally in the th theater. I'm not sure of that. Well, recently that. we saw uh, Return of the Living Dead at the Dryden yep. uh, Theater at the Eastman House. Yeah, we saw Eastman House film projection. Yeah. And they had the original songs mm -hmm. on there. Not that a lot of people would notice, but hardcore fans obviously do. But that just goes to make the point is whenever you're dealing with somebody else's property in a film that you are doing, there are so many legal hoops that you have to go through, costs and clearance and et cetera, et cetera. That if you're doing an independent film, you know micro budget stuff is w which is what we're kind of concentrating on, is if you can create the music yourself or with uh, some musicians that you know and get the clearance rights from them right up front, uh, which means you, know, you get a what you call a buyout. Uh, you write up a contract saying all any and all music that they create for the project they can you can use for any and all. Uh, products as it relates to the project that you're working on mm -hmm. and those will give you the rights to uh, not not to have to worry about that stuff down the road and if you're up front with someone right off the bat you say look i'm going to pay you once you sign this and you know you're not really cheating someone out of something they know what they're getting and they know what they're getting into and there are a lot of independent uh, musicians on uh, myspace and all over the place that uh, are interested in connecting with filmmakers so to actually say oh i need this leonard skinner tune you know it's kind of you're, you know, it's it's tough, and it, it might not even be the best way to go. And if, you know, another reason you'd want to have original music is that it's much more impressive to somebody mm -hmm. that you're trying to get noticed from. I mean, if you're talking to a potential producer or someone making your project and they're looking at your film and, it's, and you have original music in it, that's just one more thing that shows that you're a professional. That said, uh, a couple things. One is that... You know, we're talking about the right way to do it. And, of course, if you're going to theatrical and everything like that, if you're making some just backyard fun thing and you might even get it, get it to play in a couple festivals without doing it right, I mean, people do it. But, you know, if you actually want to be a professional about it and want to continue with, with this, you might as well do it the right way. Another thing is that Nine Inch Nails might be actually like conceivably like an approachable guy. Uh, Trent Reznor, the guy who does Nine Inch Nails, he uh, – He's had trouble with labels in the past, and he distributes his stuff for free on the internet sometimes. And and uh, well, yeah, it's certainly possible. But he might not actually own the song. You know, it might be the label the, that owns the song. Because yeah, because a lot of the times, anybody who hasn't knows anything about the music business knows this is that just because you write something does not mean you own the publishing rights. Mm -hmm. uh, which means is the company that you are working for or doing the music for, they own a publishing rights. Well, what what does that mean? Well, that means any time that you hear a song on a commercial mm -hmm. 
the person that get, gets paid to use that is not the artist, but it's the person who owns the publishing rights. They're the ones that get the majority of the money. And a lot of artists sign away the publishing rights to get contracts and get record deals. Yeah. So the only money that they really make is that they'll get a little bit for a, a writing fee, and they will get a certain percentage, and they will get performing money. So if it's actually them performing, they'll get a little bit of money. But the bulk of it goes to the person who owns the publishing rights. Uh, independent film, you know, it's a real tricky thing. Uh, to do. There's so many little things that you have to do in a legal sense that people just don't don't comprehend. Uh, I worked on a film after Image right. that we shot here in Rochester, and I was talking with the producers, and they sold the project uh, to Miramax. Mm -hmm. And it went to Sundance, went to Miramax. But the stack of legal papers that they had to give <laughs> to Miramax was um, it literally is probably about a foot and a half to two foot tall stack of legal papers. Wow. And all that consisted of clearance rights, actors' clearance rights, any, anybody that's in your movie. Mm -hmm. Anybody that you show in the movie has to sign a piece of paper saying, yes, it's okay for you to use my image. Mm -hmm. If they say anything or they don't say anything, you still have to do that. And anybody who whose audio comes on, it's a voiceover, somebody in the background, if you have a television show on, a TV in the background... Uh, you have to get the clearance for that. And, and if you're doing the project for yourself, you don't have to worry about it so much. But if you intend to sell the project, if you intend to have a wide audience view the project, legally that is what you're supposed to go through. Here's here's a hypothetical. Let's say maybe you're listening and you're going, well, you know, my movie's never going to be on TV or it's never going to get sold to Lionsgate. I'm just going to, you know. I'm going to take it to a DVD publisher or myself. I'm going to do replication of a yeah, thousand self, of them. Self-distribution. Self-distribute. That DVD replicator wants to know if you've got all your stuff in order because he doesn't want to be sued. Yeah, it just, yeah just another example. Just another I've, simple is going to, going to Kinko's. Mm -hmm. If you go to Kinko's and you want something Xeroxed, if it's a copywritten material, yeah. uh, they won't do it. Oh. They won't do it. And if it looks like it's a copywritten material, even if it's your own, you ha sometimes you have to sign something saying that is your mm -hmm. material because they will get in trouble for That's doing that. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I, I just know from the point of view of I've produced three DVDs now, um, authored them and, and, and taken them through the channels of uh, to a DVD replicator and make up a thousand copies, package them and everything. So we had to do... Um, for our cartoons, we had to have our voice release forms. We were using music from libraries, and we had license agreements to use that, and we had to prove these are the license agreements we paid for for this track and this track. And I had to itemize every yeah. single track and where they came from. I did the same thing with the documentary DVDs we did. And sometimes, and I know Matt um, will hopefully talk more about this, mm -hmm. but he had um, royalty-free music that yep. he got. Right. And he couldn't end up using it. Mm. Um, because so of the license agreement, didn't for the allow for it, maybe. Didn't allow for it, which was very, very confusing. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully we'll have him on the next uh, episode or so. Yeah, just because you buy royalty-free music, you know, what you're doing is you're not buying the music. You're buying the rights to the music. It just means you're not, you don't have to pay for it for doing what you're doing, but it doesn't mean you can use it for everything right. either. The, yeah, you have to read the fine print. I'm going to read another email yep. here. It says, this one's from Nick, and Nick is in Australia. Very nice. It says, hi, guys. I'm a fan from Sydney, Australia. Only 16, but inspiring indie film writer, director, and actor. I was wondering, would you recommend moving to L.A. Hollywood to pursue a career in uh, any of these fields? And he goes on to say, how did you start your own careers? And uh, please email me or answer my question on the show. Well, obviously, we're answering your question on the show. <laughs> and he said he can't wait for the next episode. Nick. Well, thank you, Nick. That's good to hear. Nice to hear from Australia. Yeah, but we're not going to answer your question because it's silly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, do you want to move to L.A. and Hollywood? Well, I did do that. I was out in L.A. Uh, I'm sorry, L.A. Yes. And uh, I was out there for some time. And I did like it uh, work-wise. The city itself is something different if you're not from the area. I'm, I'm of course, from the East Coast. Um, but in general terms of getting into the film business, 
Um, a couple of things I could su- suggest is what I had done is <clears throat> when you when you uh, get out of high school, you make a decision. Do you want to go to film school or do you want to start working in the business? Uh, film school is a good thing. It teaches you uh, a lot of technical aspects of cinema and you get to meet uh, people and other like-minded people and you, and you start learning to make films. Some people do that. I did it for a short time. Uh, then I started working in the business and uh, never ended up going back to school, which I still may do. Of course, I'm in my 40s now. So, what are you going to learn? What am I going to learn? Uh, the other the other option is is to um, just start being a production assistant. Now, what does that mean? Well, you find uh, film productions that are going on, and I happen to know in Sydney there is quite a bit of production going on, a number of films, and you look up the production companies. And you call them up and say, hey, I'm, you know, 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to uh, learn filmmaking. I, I'm willing to work on your movie for free as a PA. And uh, PA is a production assistant. And basically what you're going to be doing is you're, you want to call a gopher. You're just going to whatever they need. You know, you got to go pick up an actor. You know, you're going you know, to go get lunch. You're going to get craft service. You're going to get coffee. And this is how you get your foot in the door. And once you're there... And it's not really that difficult to get PA work. I mean, when I was in New York, it's diff- it might be difficult to get paid for it. Uh, well, I, when I was in New York, I you didn't expect to get paid for it right away. Right. There is a you know, there's a certain way of going to do things, but you do it once or twice. Yep. And get then a you then you say, okay, on well, the next job, I really I really need to get paid for this. Mm-hmm. And it's not very much money, you know. But the what you're doing is you're learning the business. And once you're in. Mm-hmm. Once you're PAing, you decide, you look at all the departments. You say, and what departments are there? Well, there's the camera department, and obviously that's the director of photography, the camera assistants, the glo- loaders, uh, and that's one department. Then there's the director, of course, mm-hmm. and then there is the production, which is basically the office that runs the production. They are the ones that get everything flowing and make sure all the rights are there, all the... You know, it's not the, it's the least glamorous, but it's probably, without them, nothing ever gets done. And uh, there's lighting, uh, which you have your grip and electric, and the head of that department is called a gaffer, who is in charge of lighting, and generally he's responsible for much of the way the film looks. The director of photography will tell the gaffer, I need to have this lit in, let's say, a Rembrandt style of lighting. Mm-hmm. And then the gaffer will go and have his crew do that. So you pick a department that you might want to go into, and then you try to PA in that department. And then basically you just it's just a matter of working your way up through the ranks like everything else. Uh, if you're trying to be a writer and director, the thing that you'd want to do at the same time you're doing this is to make your own movies. It doesn't matter what format you're shooting in. You can have a mini DV camera and just start making movies, watch movies, analyze them, take some of the best films and look like, for instance, The Godfather, one and two. Watch that, but just don't watch it as an entertainment. Watch it to figure out why is this one of the best movies ever created? What 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 did Francis Ford Coppola do to make this? And you look at it and you say, is it the cinematography? What about the cinematography makes this film work? What about the editing? You know, is the editing uh, of this movie making this a great movie, or is it everything all together? How is the camera moving? How how are the actors moving through the scene? How are the actors delivering their lines? You become, you know, you, and, I, and I warn you right now, <laughs> by doing this, it takes some of the fun out of watching a movie because eventually you almost can't help but go into a movie and yeah. analyzing it and breaking it down into its components. But that's what you have to do to become a filmmaker. I wanted to say to Nick that, Basically, you know, should he move to L.A. or Hollywood or whatever? That's one of those things where it's personal for everybody. You can't – I can't give him that answer. It's very expensive. Of course. But uh, my gut would say don't wait for someone's permission. Don't say, oh, gee, I can't do it because I'm living in Sydney, Australia. No, you, you know, you've got friends. If you have people that you find in Sydney that are interested, you do it with them. If you can't find anyone interested, do it uh, as animation. You know, do it all yourself. Or – um, you yeah, find a local film group and, and talk with other people who are doing that sort of thing. You know, there are films that come out of Australia. You know, it's, I don't know a lot it's about It's a fairly prolific yeah. place, you know. A couple of movies that came to mind the other day when I was looking stuff up were The uh, Undead was by the Spirig Brothers. They're working on a new one called uh, Daybreakers. And there was Wolf Creek a couple of years ago. Those are horror movies. But there's, 
you know, that's what I'm interested in, so that's what I know of. But uh, there are big productions that go on there or, or medium-sized productions. Well, the Matrix you, films, for instance, were oh, shot there. well, yeah, yeah. You've got uh, Star Wars and Matrix stuff out of uh, the Fox uh, studio there in Australia. Yeah, you have a good resource right there, and, and my advice would just, is, is to start there. Yeah. Uh, you just go and say, listen, I want to be a PA. I'll, I'll do it for free or whatever the lowest is that you, you have. Mm-hmm. And then getting your foot in the door is the biggest thing. One And even if you – you know, it's kind of funny because every, every time you go someplace – like I started off in New York City, got to a certain point, and then I said, well, I want to go to Los Angeles. When I went to Los Angeles, I literally had to start all over again because no one really knew me out there. Right. So I went from working on films, uh, doing projects in New York, and then when I moved to L.A., um, I started sweeping floors again. Hmm. And, you know, it was fine. I didn't really mind it. You know, I was working at a place that I always wanted to meet the owner of, David Allen. I mentioned this on the last podcast. Uh, and I had... a. I had come in with experience. I had directed commercials. I had animated commercials. I had done a number of different things. And I went there to meet this gentleman and, you know, I you know, said, I love your work, blah, blah, blah. I had only been out there a couple of weeks and I was very lucky. Did he respond lucky. nice? Did he respond to the blah, blah, blah? Was that... Uh... Well, they, yeah, yeah. He blah, you know, and then I, then I decided, well, maybe I should actually speak English, uh, and that made things much easier for wow. me. Yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah, but uh, sometimes you luck. I lucked out because they happened to need someone just to help straighten out the shop, mm-hmm. you know, to move the molds around and to move this and that. And I said, all right, I'll do that. But within like a couple of weeks, you know, there was a there was a movie called Doctor Mordred that uh, there's this gentleman that was supposed to build this floating fortress in space. Mm-hmm. It was a castle on it and a big rock, right. basically. You know, it was supposed to be like five feet tall from top to bottom. Well, he didn't end up doing it, and they were in a pinch. So I just happened to be standing there, and Dennis Gordon, as the guy who was responsible for doing the props and all the miniature work and the construction of the sets at David Allen's at the time, so, John, do you think you could do this? And, of course, when anybody ever asks you, do you think you can do this, you always say yes. Exactly. Even if you don't know. Because, because you can go home, go home and get a book. And you get a book <laughs> and you just figure it out. And then you come in and do it. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I didn't know how to. I happened to say yes, I didn't know how to do it because I had that experience right. I spoke of earlier. So I, I made this big floating. You could see it in the movie. This, I sculpted it out of plaster, this big giant rock. And we had these castle pieces made out of wood that were sitting on top of it. And it worked out. And from that point on, I was working uh, doing that. And I wasn't sweeping floors anymore. But the the point I'm getting to, you have to be there. You have to be in the situation. Uh, you have to make your opportunity. You just sit and you wait. And you, know, you make sure that you know people know who you are without being too pushy. Right. And then, you know, then you'll be good. Yeah, you have to, you know, it's not some secret club. If you've got some skills and are competent and you are friendly and you're yeah exactly not overselling yourself. Yeah, too you much. don't you don't want to ask too many questions. You don't want to prove to everybody that you know everything either. You just want to be there and you want to come across as a competent person. Right. And you don't want to be a show off. You don't you want to say oh I did this I did that I did this I did that. Mm-hmm. But if somebody asks you, you say, yes, I can do that. Uh, I would have my work with me that I've done in the past. You know, that we're, we're, Now we're talking about getting work in you know, the effects business. Okay. And I had done a sc- number of sculptures. And I did. if you're in Rochester, uh, you've, maybe you've seen the Christmas House Guitars commercial that was done in Clay Animation, which I uh, animated yes. with, with Fred Ar- Armstrong here at Animatus mm-hmm. here in Rochester and Ali Peed, another – Back local. before my time. Back back before Mike was around, <laughs> but uh, so I had a, I had a number of things already before I went out to L.A. So that's my point, I guess. That you know, build up something in Sydney, you know, get some experience, and if you might want to just stay in Sydney, uh, I, I tell you, I mean, uh, Los Angeles isn't all that it's cracked up to be. I mean, I hate to say negative things about it, right? But it, it is a different type of attitude. I am definitely much more of an East Coast type of person i like working on films that are shot out here it, it, it it's it's different it's hard to put into uh, words mm-hmm. you know but if you're if you're not from the la area some people love it my buddy derek devoe he's been a sculptor for years he was in rochester and he went from working on um oh what was that movie brain damage i think it was um the uh 
uh, the guy Frank did Helen Lauder. Yeah, he did Basket Case, but yeah. he's and he. I remember they, uh, they in Rochester they did uh, they made most of the creature stuff for uh, brain damage. Oh. David David Kinlan. That was the one with the creature that was like look sort at of in his shoulder or in his yeah look, yeah it look like at it was a, br- a, sh- a brain on top of a shaft. Yeah, okay, right. Basically, is what it was, and and then Day of the Dead. You know, they went to work on, on Day of the Dead. Uh, Dave Killen, another mm-hmm. uh, person who was from Rochester, or at least was here for quite some time, and Derek DeVoe, they went to work on Day of the Dead. Derek is a sculptor, and Dave Killen did all the mechanics. And they, boom, right after that, they went out to L.A. Yeah. Dave also did Evil Dead. And when he got out there, Dave did Evil Dead 2. Mm-hmm. And he went on to do stuff for everybody in the business, including Rick Baker. And then I was visiting when he was working at Stan Winston's place. Oh, really? When we when there he was in the middle of making the bats for the movie that just was released this past year, Monster Squad. Just released on DVD. Just released on DVD. Came out in like 86, 87. Right. Yeah, just came out. But these are people that started off in a smaller town, mm-hmm. got a level of work. They did things on their own. Yep. Tom Savini happened to, I believe Savini was here in Rochester for some reason. I don't know why. And I was a little bit younger at the time. Mm-hmm. These guys are slightly older than me. Saw the work that David Kinlan did. And Derek, uh, and there's another, uh, uh, Pat Tentello, I think his name was, uh, they all ended up going to, to Pittsburgh to work on, on, on Day of the Dead. To get back to uh, Nick's question a little bit, uh, you know, I would offer advice too that, you know, guys like Spielberg and John Carpenter, or even like uh, uh, M. Night Shyamalan, you know, they were doing films as kids and they're not, uh, even like Ron Howard, I'm thinking of guys that they just, they were doing them. They were doing them on film or they were doing them on video. And it's not something you can go into the store and buy now because they're embarrassed about them. But, you, you know, you do them when you're a kid and it's okay, you know, and, and you get people to help you out. And then everything you do is a learning process and you can actually, you know, then the next thing you do is uh, is even better. If you want to make movies, then you make movies. Yeah, you don't wait. It's kind of sounds silly, but just grab the camera, get a couple of friends, even if it's just a minute project you know it started yeah. off small yeah you, you might just not go want to do a feature right off no the just go out and shoot you know, learn what it is to edit you know learn what it is to do different camera angles mm-hmm. learn what it is to shoot in different lighting conditions uh mm-hmm. film school is what you do to learn all of this in a very concentrated area with other people from um professors who supposedly kind of know what they're doing sometimes they do sometimes they don't mm-hmm. And uh, but you can do that on your own too. DVD commentaries are you know a great source of information. Yeah, too. when when I was younger, they didn't have any of that right. stuff. So what I, I ended up doing was reading everything I could get my hands on. Yep. Making phone calls. Cinefix magazine is a good one right now. Cinefix magazine. I had to get that and and uh, Cinemagic because I was like again I started off wanting to do visual effects and stop motion animation, so I would get everything I could find. Yep. On this stuff, and read, and then experiment, get it, find other people, other like-minded people, and work on stuff. Part of his question was how you know how did we get started? We talked about how you got started. Me, uh, I went to school for uh, art, and uh, you know I studied a lot of uh, literature and 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 art studio, um, and I didn't really get into filmmaking and cartooning. Uh, well, cartooning I was doing since I was a kid. So I knew I wanted to do something in art or advertising, and little by little I learned that I was, you know, interested in commercial work or or films, and uh, I met up with uh, Fred Armstrong of Animatus after I got out of college and uh, interned with them for a while, worked on their cartoons, and now, you know, I've just been doing a lot of different odds and ends jobs there, you know, every single step in the pipeline, you know, from pencil on paper, taking to the computer. Um, Editing, sound, DVD authoring. I, I've I've tried a little bit of everything. Just by you even did it. script supervising on my my project. That's correct. Yep. And well, you gave me the chance to do that, which I appreciated because you know I don't know you saw something. That, hey, Mike's kind of smart. I guess he can try this. And, uh, yeah. Well, that, that's the key. And, and, and being a director and producer, ninety uh, percent of that job is finding the right people to do that job. Mm-hmm. That goes right even doing small films. That is what directing is. Find the right people, tell the people what you want, and let them do it. Yeah, you have and to give up. Back. A, have to uh, trust. You find someone you can trust, and then you can share the you know share the responsibility.
I think that'll about do it for this episode. If you want to write to us with any other questions, feel free. We are at feedback at maddogmovies.com. That's our email. If you want to just go to our website for the podcast, that's maddogmovies.com slash podcast. And if you'd like to visit our personal websites, uh, philrosefilms.com is mine. That's P-H-I-L-R-O-S-E films.com. And that'll about do it for another episode. See you next time. Take care, folks. Music for this episode was provided by Keith Handy. Visit him online at keithhandy.com.